Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the Humenau University of Technology. I am Renato, and on this tutorial, we are going to start talking about window functions and how to design filters using this window method. Let's get started. Last time we saw how we can obtain the impulse response of the ideal low-pass filter, the sync function. The problem of this impulse response is that it's non-causal and we also cannot make it causal because it starts at minus infinity. We cannot add infinite delay. So here is our sync fun function going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Assume we would like to have a causal finite impulse response, uh, FIR low-pass filter, meaning the impulse response starts at time zero and extends over only a finite amount of samples and goes from zero to L minus one for a length L. So observe that FIR filters have no, no correspondence in the analog domain. Analog filters always have an infinite impulse response, IIR. How do we design this filter such that it becomes similar in some sense to the ideal? since we cannot get the ideal filter. So let's take a look at this example. We will design an anti-aliasing filter for sampling rate conversion. The original signal is from a CD with 44.1 uh, kilohertz sampling rate, hence an audio bandwidth of about up to uh, 20 kilohertz. And we would like to downsample it to 22 kilohertz sampling rate for example, for a Mac computer. In order to be able to downsample it, we first have to low pass it. For instance, the pass band should be from zero to nine kilohertz and the stop band to avoid aliasing of frequencies above 11 kilohertz should be from 11 kilohertz on to the maximum. Here is 22.05 kilohertz. Since we don't have an ideal filter, we need to include a transition band here from 9 kilohertz to 11 kilohertz to let the filter transition from pass band to stop band with intermediate attenuations. Aliasing is something that is easily perceived by the ear, hence we would like to have at least 60 dB attenuation from 11 kilohertz and up. The pass band can take some ripples in the frequency response, for instance plus or minus 2 dB corresponding to about plus or minus 25% in voltage. The frequency range from 9 kHz to 11 kHz is the so-called transition band, which gives the filter space to build up its attenuation from 0 to 60 dB to make sure it already has the 60 dB at 11 kHz. In this way, we can formulate requirements for a similarity of our filter, even though we know we cannot reach the optimum. So that's a practical approach. A first and perhaps naive approach is to define the similarity as the quadratic error of the frequency response of our FIR filter to our given ideal frequency response. Mostly this means the magnitude of the frequency response. This has the advantage of being mathematically very simple. This means our goal is to minimize this quadratic error. So assume our desired frequency response is H d of omega and the real frequency response of our causal FIR filter is h of omega. Then the quadratic error is given by this integral here. So we would like to make this error as small as possible. Observe that we need an integral here because the frequency domain signal is continuous since the time domain signal is not periodic. Only then would the Fourier transform be discrete over the frequency. But here, we have the sync function with infinite extent over time. Observe that because of this, we also cannot apply the discrete Fourier transform because it's made for periodic signals with a finite period. period. The DFT is usually applied just to this finite period. But the discrete time Fourier transform is for discrete time signals with infinite period. We need to minimize the quadratic error E to find the best approximation with our FIR filter. 
We cannot solve this problem in the frequency domain, but we can solve the equivalent formulation in the time domain. To obtain this, we use the so-called Parseval theorem, which states that the power of a signal, the sum of its magnitude squares, is the same in the time and in the frequency domain. This is true for the discrete time Fourier transform as well as for the DFT. So here we have the Parseval theorem. Uh, so the power of a signal is the same in the time and in the frequency domain. The beauty here is now is that we obtain a sum which we can now compute more easily. So we want to obtain h of n. For our ideal low pass future, h of t was the sync function. To obtain a causal future, we already allow the time shift n t for the ideal impulse response using our FIR future h of n makes causality possible. Plugging this into this equation yields this other equation here. So how should we choose h of n and the delay n of d to obtain the minimum possible quadratic error e for a given length L of h of n? So how should we choose h of n and the delay n of d to obtain the minimum possible quadratic error e for a given length l of h of n? Given the length l, we need to determine the l coefficients h of n and the delay parameter n of d. To make this solution more easy to see, we can divide the sum into two parts, one over the extent of h of n and one for the rest. So here we are dividing into sum, so 1 for the uh, extent of um, h of n and 1 for the rest. So n is smaller than 0 and n is um, bigger than L minus 1. Both terms are positive, so to minimize E we have to minimize both terms. To minimize the right hand term we only have n of t. So we can choose n of t such only the smallest values appear there and the biggest values of h of d are not seen by the right hand sum and covered by h of n in the left hand sum. We can imagine the left hand sum being a so-called rectangular window where we can shift the sync function over this window function to obtain h of n. The rectangular window is a function which has the value 1 inside the window length and the value 0 outside the window length. The finite sum can be imagined as resulting from first multiplying the infinite sync function with this rectangular window and then compute the sum which hence becomes finite. The goal here would be to shift the sync function using the delay n of d such that the window for h of n sees the biggest values of the sync function. Observe that this leads to a contiguous impulse response. Using the above formulas, it would also be possible to just pick the biggest magnitude values of the sync uh, function for h of n, the maxima and minima. For a non-contiguous impulse response, which would lead to a smaller quadratic error for L coefficients. So how would the resulting frequency response look like? Let's assume L equals to 2, then we have a future with two coefficients. The biggest two values in the sync function are around the center, around 0. Hence, we would like to choose a delay of half a sample so that the new center is around n equals to 0 0.5 and the right-hand side see some, sees only the smaller values. In general, we would like to choose this delay, n of d equals to L, the future length, minus 1, divided by 2, meaning that we shift the maximum of the sync function exactly in the center of our window for h of n. What do we do with the left-hand side inside of our window? 
we choose h of n identical to h of t of n and the left hand sum with the window becomes indeed zero this way we get a simple recipe for designing an FIR filter with minimum squared error. Take the center of the sink function, or the ideal impulse response, h of t, and window it with a so-called rectangular window, because it has a rectangular form in time or space. Inside the sum for h of n, this imagined window has a value of 1, and outside it has a value of 0. So here is our sink function, here is our window, our rectangular window, and we are shifting the sync function so that the maximum value is in the center of the rectangular window. So we just apply a delay and d equals to L minus 1 divided by 2. And this is this FIR filter H of n. This imagined window function will become more interesting if we modify the values from one to other values. So we can see FIR filter equals to the thing, sync function times the rectangular window in this case. Observe that if we only use a finite piece of the sync function as our filter, we implicitly already apply the rectangular window. Hence, there is no need to apply it explicitly anymore. This multiplication of the rectangular window with the ideal impulse response in the time domain becomes a convolution of the DTFT of the rectangular window with the ideal frequency response in the frequency domain. In this way, we can see the result in the frequency domain. In effect, the ideal frequency response of the sync function is blurred by convolving it with the DTFT of the window function. Ideally, this DTFT of the window should be an impulse at frequency zero, because then the convolution would not change the ideal frequency response. But this would mean an infinitely long window in the time domain. We have a finite rectangular window in the time domain, which becomes another sync function in the frequency domain. And that's quite different from pulse at frequency zero. Observe that the longer the window in the time domain, the more narrow its sync function in the frequency domain becomes, and the more similar to an impulse. Hence, for better filters, we need a longer window. So now, let's have a Python example for the rectangular window. So here, I'm using matplotlib to plot in uh, NumPy for um, mathematical computations. And we're defining a rectangular window with uh, 11 samples from 0 to 10. And here there are 0 when... Um, n is smaller than 0, and 0 when n is bigger than 10. So this is just constructing our rectangular window. Now I'm going to use uh, Py, IPy widgets interact just to give some interaction uh, of our uh, plot. And we can change the length of the uh, rectangular window. We are going to use some IPy widgets as just a slider. We are also going to use SciPy signal to compute the frequency response of the rectangular window. And here, this is how we're defining this interact with a slider. And this is the function to plot the, the uh, frequency response of the rectangular window. So we're defining our um, rectangular window in the time domain. Then we're calculating with signal frac z. So SciPy signal frac z, we're calculating the frequency response. Here we are um, having the magnitude of the frequency response in um, 20 log 10, so it's in dB, and we are finding uh, some maximum values. So we will have here like this uh, we have the omega at 3 dB, and we have the omega at the uh, first side lobe, so we can have. Um, better see this attenuation from um, omega equals to minus 3 dB and um, omega at the uh, peak of the side lobe. Then this part here we are using to annotate, so we are creating these arrows and this text. And then we have two plots, one for the magnitude in dB and one for the phase in degree in the degrees. 
and here we have a slider and just a unwrap so we can see uh, the linear phase easier uh, when using unwrap so this is our uh, function it's interact it's a rectangular window so it starts with a 16 uh, the length of this rectangle window and we see that if we make the window longer we see that it's trying to go and become similar to an impulse but of course we cannot go infinitely long so we will always have these characteristics and we see that even this attenuation uh, for the, the peak of the side lobe uh, it decreases but it's not so significant in this case so we have we notice that the longer the window the narrower become the main lobe and if we go for example to a very short window so let's say uh, eight then we see that the main lobe and also the side lobes they become wider and we have this difference in attenuation here so we have from uh, minus 3 db to minus 12 db so maybe we have here something like 10 db and here how the phase also it's a linear phase so this is just um, a pot so we can investigate a bit more the rectangular window and we can see that this is far for, for bringing an impulse at frequency zero in fact it's somewhat broad and also the attenuation is not very high so it's in the order of uh, minus 15 to minus 20 db we expect that our resulting low pass filter will inherit these properties through the convolution in the frequency domain so the pass band or the main lobe width of our function will determine the transition bandwidth so the main lobe width of our function so let's uh, have a the main lobe width will determine the transition band of our resulting filter and the stop band attenuation of the window will determine the resulting stop band attenuation of our filter so this shows that the window function shapes the key characteristics of our resulting FIR filter. Let's go back to our example of downsampling filter which should attenuate frequencies starting at 11 kHz at a sampling rate of 44.1 kHz. We would like to have minus 60 dB attenuation in the stop band. Hence, we obtain the normalized frequency for the start of our stop band as 11 divided by 44.1 times 2 times pi and we have 0 0.5 pi this is the uh, start of our stop band hence our desired frequency response is 1 between frequency 0 and omega s or better between minus omega s to plus omega, uh, omega s to also include the negative frequency axis now we take the inverse DTFT of the ideal desired frequency response, H desired, of omega, to obtain the ideal impulse response, H desired of F. Since at first we assume an, an ideal filter, we set the end of the pass band identical to the beginning of the stop band. So HC is equal to HS. And this is the end of the pass band identical to the beginning of stop end. So here we have our H of D, our desired, so this is the ideal, and we have this integral, this is the H of D, and when we solve, we have this, uh, we must remember this trigonometric property here, that the sine of omega, it's uh, equivalent of this sum um, of uh, exponentials, so it's A, 1 divided by 2 times um, 
j, the imaginary number, times e to the power of j omega minus e to the power of minus j omega. And if we replace this here, we have this, so the h desired of n equals to the sine omega c times n divided by pi times n. So let's uh, take a look at the approximation of an ideal low pass filter using a rectangular window and delay. We've seen that the impulse response of an ideal low pass filter is given by this equation here. So it's the sine of omega c times n divided by pi times omega n. Truncating the impulse response, so multiplying by a rectangular window, so it has a length L, and applying a delay of n d equals to L minus 1 divided by 2, so we're replacing here, so n, and we will apply a delay, and we will make this delay equals to L minus 1 divided by 2. We can also use sin pi to solve this. So here I'm importing sin pi and I'm importing sine, symbols, simplify, pi, lambda phi, and limit. Here I'm defining my symbol of omega c and other symbols are the n and the l, so the length and the n. Here then I am defining the delay, so it's l minus 1 divided by 2. And here we have our sine of omega times n minus nd, so it's the delay, divided by pi times n minus nd, and nd is equal to L minus 1 divided by 2. So when we uh, set sin pi, it gives us this expression here, which is equivalent to this one here. We can also see that the limit yeah, when n is equal to L minus 1 divided by 2, we would have here a division by 0, and we, need to, we can take a limit to see that's the value, so the value is omega c divided by pi, the limit when n is equal goes to L minus 1 divided by 2. So here we have uh, the plots, so we will uh, assume that L is equal to 16, and I'm here using lambda phi, so I want that these symbolic expressions become available to use with numpy, so I can use this lambda phi instead of redefining them uh, using numpy. Then I'm defining some axes and figures for our plots. I'm using interact again, so we can use this slider to change the values of the length of our uh, filter and also the omega c. For now, I will leave like this. So here we are using again frac z to um, calculate the frequency response. Here we have the impulse response. So we're just doing something for even and for odd um, values of L. So depending if L is even, we will use the um, impulse response like this, and if it's odd, we will have this uh, impulse response given by this here. So we have this value for um, when i is equal to the uh, delay. So it, we can see here there is this big difference because for even there is here supposedly uh, at 7.5 when we're using a 16, but if we go, for example, to 15, and then we need this value here, and when n is equal to um, the delay, we would end up with that, what we discussed before, this would go to zero, so we need to take the limit and we need to find out the value for n is equal to L minus 1 divided by 2. And this is what we are doing here. 
then we are having the magnitude in db also some annotations to find out the uh, the omega at minus 3 db and the omega for the peak of the side lobe and also we are plotting phase and that's what we have here now if we use our example that l is equal to 16 so 16 minus 1 is 15 divided by 2 is 7.5 and we can have here calculate our delay and it's equal to 7.5 so this is what we're doing l is equal to 16 our delay to make the resulting filter cause with 7.5 then our filter becomes this um, expression here and this is our resulting causal fir filter with a rectangular function so we can see that the pass band has some ripples so we can uh, zoom in a bit to see the ripples so we see the ripples in the pass band and they are more or less um, plus or minus 0 0.5 db corresponding to a factor of uh, six percent of over or undershoot and that's usually okay but we can also see that this filter has maybe minus 10 db attenuation and the first side lobe has only about minus 20 db attenuation so if we go back to we have here the second side lobe here is more or less minus 20 db attenuation and uh, is not satisfying our requirement for at least minus 60 db uh, starting at normalized frequency 0 0.5 pi for the phase plot we have a delay of 7.5 and this is a linear phase so we expect the phase to be minus 7.5 times omega and we can verify this in our plots for example if you, you take a certain frequency and then you obtain 7.5 times if it's a 0 0.1 and then pi 180 divided by pi is more or less 135 and you can see uh, here we are not in um, degrees but you can also set and look for example here when uh, there is a value for omega and you see the angle and you just make these calculations and you see that this is how we verify the delay now um, we have a filter with the minimum squared error in comparison with the ideal filter but this is um, not really what we like to have the problem is that we get the so-called gibbs phenomenon it says that the error appears as ripples along the magnitude of the pass band and the stop band. The interesting part is that the ripples near the pass band and stop band, they don't become smaller as L becomes larger. So, but they only become more narrow. So this is uh, the result of convolving our ideal frequency response with the sync function from the rectangular window. The sync function only becomes narrower as we increase its length but the height of the ripples they stay the same and we can verify if we increase we see it's becoming narrower but we don't see significant change in the height of the This means that the maximum error that we retain does not become smaller as we, as we increase L. So observe that the ripple size near the pass band and stop band only becomes more narrow, hence a reduced area and hence a reduced quadratic error, but their height does not become smaller with increasing L. Here they always stay at around 0 0.1 in the stop band, which corresponds to about minus 20 dB which is not sufficient for uh, our aliasing future example. To see how the Gibbs phenomenon results, we can take a look at our scheme in the frequency domain.
So in principle, we multiplied our ideal impulse response with the rectangular window. In the frequency domain, this means a convolution of the ideal frequency response with a phase change through a delay ND with the frequency response of the rectangular window. The later is a narrow sync function which corresponds in ripples to the sides of its main lobe. And those ripples are what shows up as Gibson phenomenon. If we make our window uh, longer, the sync function becomes more narrow, but the height of the ripples does not decrease, but stays constant. Actually, in most applications, what we want is not minimizing the quadratic error, but minimizing the maximum error. So basically, we chose the wrong error measure. This suggests a modification to lower the height of the ripples. And instead of a rectangular window, we can take alternative windows which have lower ripples in the frequency domain. And very common used windows are the raised cosine or the sine window.